how thankful I am. Oh, how grateful I am to you, Lord, because you are so good. Oh, how thankful I am. Oh, how grateful I am to you, Lord, because you are so good. I will sing songs of praise to bless your holy name. My soul delights in giving worship to you. I will proclaim with my lips the joy that's in my heart to tell all of your goodness and mercy to me. Oh, how thankful I am. Oh, how grateful I am to you, Lord, because you are so good. Oh, how thankful I am. Oh, how grateful I am to you, Lord, because you are so good. I will sing songs of praise to bless your holy my soul delights in giving worship to you. I will proclaim with my lips the joy that's in my heart to tell all of your goodness and mercy to me. I will sing songs of praise to bless your holy name. My soul delights in giving worship to you. I will proclaim with my lips the joy that's in my heart to tell all of your goodness and mercy to me. Oh, how thankful I am. Oh, how grateful I am to you, Lord, because you are so good. Oh, how thankful I am. Oh, how grateful I am to you, Lord because you are so good to you, Lord, because you are so good. We invite you to stand if you are able for the reading of the gospel. And let us hear these works, words from the uh, gospel according to St. Luke. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with skin diseases approached him, keeping their distance from him. They raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, weren't ten cleansed? Where? Or the other nine. No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, Get up and go. 
your faith has healed you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Would you join me in prayer? And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our wisdom, our salvation. Amen. Gratitude. The grateful life is a good life. We know from all kinds of studies that have been done that grateful people are the happiest people. Grateful people are more generous. Grateful people complain less. Grateful people think less of themselves and more of others. Grateful people just spread more joy. And so gratitude is good. Grateful people think less about what they are owed and more about their obligations to others. We now are in this holiday season, and we're coming up Thursday on Thanksgiving, and in spite of 2020 and everything that's been going on, Thanksgiving has not been canceled. And that's a good thing. We need Thanksgiving more this year than I think probably in the past. It's important to be thankful. One of the spiritual disciplines that some people practice is that every day, a lot of times at the end of the day, though you could probably do it at other times, at the end of the day they stop and reflect on the the day and they try to come up with five things that they're grateful for that happened in that day. Grateful for the phone call of encouragement from someone. Grateful for the sales clerk that went the, the extra mile to help them find something they couldn't find. It's little things. And when we get into that kind of habit, that kind of practice, even if the day's been terrible, when people sit down and think, what has happened in this day for which I am grateful? That just tends to rub off on your disposition over time, you know? And you tend to go through life then looking for things, and even the, the trivial things, looking for things for which to be grateful. Our story from Luke's Gospel this morning is one of gratitude. Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem. He's on the last leg of his journey. He's going to get to Jerusalem, and from there things are going to deteriorate, and he will be arrested and crucified. But he's on his way from Galilee down to Judea in the south, and of course they've got to cross through Samaria, which is foreign territory, if you're a good Jew. And we're told as Jesus is getting into that region, South Galilee, North Samaria, ten lepers see him. Our translation says a serious skin condition. The term for leprosy in the New Testament is just a general term that refers to skin conditions of all sorts, minor and serious, some contagious, some not. But if you had this some kind of skin condition, what it usually meant is that, particularly since some of them were contagious, you were considered unclean. So you were separated from the community. Can you imagine for a moment coming down with some kind of skin condition? And what that means is that not only you might be uncomfortable, it might itch, you know, it might be sore, but now you can't even live with your family. You can't be near them. You have to live in a leper colony, literally. You have to wall yourself off. So your whole life is just disrupted. And 
If your condition happened to clear up and get better, before you could join your family, before you could join your village again, you had to go to the priest. And the priest was the one who had to look at you and declare that you were clean, that you were okay to go back. And some people, no doubt, uh, their conditions, whatever they were, were temporary. But can you imagine if you're one of those persons that that's not the case? And you've spent years isolated, away from family. Your only friends are fellow lepers. And so here are these ten lepers who come running to Jesus. Obviously, Jesus' fame has preceded him. And they cry out to him, make us clean, make us clean. And it's real interesting what Jesus does. He says, go show yourselves to the priest. He didn't say they're healed. He just said, go show yourselves to the priest. And we're told that as they turned to go to the priest, it was then that they were healed. It's almost like that act of faith of turning to do what Jesus said plays a role in their healing. And so off they go. And we're told that when one of the ten men realized what has happened, he goes back. The other nine go off rejoicing. Now, there's part of me that wants to have a little sympathy for them because perhaps they're so excited they can't wait to join their families again. I mean, that would be me. If I hadn't seen my family in, in, in months, maybe, maybe even a year or two because of this, and now I would get to do that, I don't know, I just might run off without thinking. But this one man turns around to give thanks to God. And Jesus takes note that he's a Samaritan, that he's a foreigner. And why is that important? It's important because you know what happens, folks. We all do this. We do it today. 2,000 years later, it's not any different. People who are different from us, people we're not sure about, people who are strange from us or groups of people we can tend to stereotype in order to dismiss them. This is what a stereotype is. We, we label somebody or, or a group of people in order to dismiss them. You know, those people or this person or that, you know, well, you know, he's such and such, she's such and such. And it's a way to just kind of dismiss. And no doubt you had many of Jesus' own people who had dismissed Samaritans as ungrateful people. You know, they're just not grateful they don't worship the way we do, et cetera, et cetera. And so Jesus just sort of makes this point that this Samaritan who had no doubt been stereotyped and dismissed was actually the one who reflected a faithful response to God. <laughs> and he was thankful. And so there's no doubt gratitude is the order of the day in this week as we're grateful, and we're going to gather together with others for Thanksgiving. It's probably going to look different from most years. Don't know what your plans are, but, you know, it's just certainly not going to be like it's been, and maybe there will be people, there's people that we normally see that we're going to miss this year because we're just not going to go there, but we're going to be thankful. But one of the questions I kind of want to dig into for a minute is... When we read the story of the ten lepers, I want to ask the question, what about the eleventh leper? No, there's no eleventh leper in the story. But, what about the lepers that were not healed? Jesus certainly did healing in his ministry, but he didn't heal everybody. Jesus actually raised a couple of people from the dead, but he didn't do that to everybody. How to be grateful when you're not the one who receives the miracle or your family member is not the one who receives the miracle? What about in this time of pandemic of over 250,000 people who have lost their lives due to COVID or a complication from COVID? And, of course, there are plenty of others who have died for other reasons. But what about those who, in this season, in this year, 
because life has just thrown them a curveball they could never imagine. How are they to be grateful in this time? I just want to read to you just a couple. Of, this is from an article uh, called 60 Lives, 60 Days, and it's stories of victims who've lost their lives from COVID-19. I'm not going to read all 60, obviously. But I want to just point out a couple here and just a couple things. So here's a woman named Patricia. She was the first person who died from COVID in Illinois. Patricia spent her career caring for others as a nurse. Her nephew said his aunt always had a knack for helping people, and her main thing was to see people smile. She was very spiritual. She loved to read, my aunt loved to read the Bible and loved to play with her nieces and nephews. She was always available. In March, a trip to an Illinois hospital for breathing troubles would lead to the sudden tragedy the family is still trying to understand. Patricia died on March 16th from the coronavirus. And while her family was still trying to come to terms with Patricia's death, her sister Wanda began to show symptoms. And a little over a week later, Wanda was also dead. And then here's the story of Alvin, who believed in second chances. They were sacred to him. And he believed everybody deserved them. And he had planned to make the most of his second chances. He definitely felt like he had a second chance. And he was working on that. His sister says, I can actually say that I think my brother was on the best path he had ever been on in his entire life. He was an army vet, served in Desert Storm. He worked in a hospital. He loved helping other people. And yet he caught COVID and died as well. Let me just do one more. Lawrence knew everyone in the city of Milwaukee. His son used to say every time we went somewhere, Lawrence, my father would see somebody who knew him, who he knew. He was retired from the Navy. He worked as a firefighter for more than three decades. In fact, his self-driven life of service was so inspiring to his son that his son joined the Navy. And yet he too died from COVID. What about the 11th leper? What about the persons this year who in this time are so struggling with grief that's beyond words, with all kinds of difficulty? It's not just losing somebody to COVID or, or seeing somebody struggle with the after effects of COVID, but people who have lost jobs or people who, whose jobs have been curtailed, who are struggling, people who are just trying to hold on to paying the bills. What about those folks who struggle with gratitude? They're not, in, they're not ungrateful people in life, not at all. It's just that this is a special time and can be so difficult in this time. So let me offer just a couple thoughts. If you're one of those persons who's struggling with gratitude, because this has just been an unprecedented year, you're, you're just having a hard time giving thanks because that family member is no longer going to be at the Thanksgiving table or because dreams and plans you've had seem set back for a long time, whatever it might be. One thing I want to say is for those who are struggling to be grateful in this time, God understands. God gets it. God doesn't get angry at that. 
You know, long before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah foretold the time of the coming of Jesus, the suffering servant, and Isaiah says that the suffering servant was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Jesus knows our sorrows and our grief. It's okay to have times where we struggle to be thankful. In fact, one of the things we can do when we're having those times is we can do what some of the psalmists do, the lament psalms, right? Um, you know, you get these psalms where, where the psalmist is angry or hurting or upset, and boy, they're just honest with God. In a sense, what they say to God is, you know, I know I should be thankful, but frankly, right now, I'm not doing a good job of it, and I don't feel that way. It's okay to be honest with God. I always say we might as well be honest. He knows what we're thinking anyway. But you know something else about those lament psalms? At the end of every lament psalm, after the psalmist complains and expresses frustration and, and just bears his soul to God, at the end the psalmist always ends, but you know what? I still trust in you. And I thank you. And so maybe another thing that for those struggling with gratitude this year and this time, maybe we can try and practice going down that list each day of what are just the little things, just the little things that I'm grateful for that happened today. That maybe within that will spark a little flame, a little, a little ember of gratitude that will start again. And one other thing that I want to say about that is that for those of us who may know folks who are struggling in this time, who are struggling with being thankful and being grateful, we need patience. It's okay. And in fact, what we should do is be kind of a presence to them, an encouragement to them, in a way that if they go to thank God for something, they'll say, I thank you for him. I thank you for her, because today in the midst of my grief, they were just there. They just encouraged me. Maybe we can be what people are grateful for. And I think that's what God wants us to be. One of the things I've thought about in recent weeks as I've been pondering all of this about gratitude is that this is one of those times where it really should come home to us that gratitude there's something deep about it. That, that gratitude is much deeper than just being thankful for stuff, right? I mean, yeah, we, we, we got some nice things. We got, I got a house to live in. I got, yeah, I'm grateful for all of that. But there's something deeper. When our grandchildren come over to visit, which they haven't been doing much in 2020, um, I got lots of neat stuff down in my study on my bookshelves that the kids like to play with, and I let them play with it. And sometimes my daughters will be get nervous because they'll say they're going to break it. And every time they say that, I say to them, I own nothing that I cannot lose. I own nothing that I cannot lose. So if my granddaughter breaks my Edgar Allan Poe bobblehead, which she did, it's okay. Because I'm grateful that I have a granddaughter to break something. <laughs> and so this is a time when, when we go into Thanksgiving, when we all go into this week and we celebrate and we reflect, in this time, in this 2020, which we hope we will not repeat again, that we'll be able to dig down deep and be thankful to the God who continues, even in the midst of this time, to offer gifts, give us gifts, good gifts, good gifts on which you can't put a price tag, Good gifts that ultimately really don't fade away. 
because they're the intangible gifts of love and friendship and family. Those kinds of things that in some ways it's hard to grab onto, but at the same time it's hard to just grab onto because it just surrounds us. It's so big. So in this season, let us be thankful. Thankful to the God who continues to give generously and help us to surround those who struggle in this season that we might be a cause of gratitude for them. Let us pray. Gracious God, how thankful we are for just how generous you are. It's true that no matter how much we might try in life, we can't outgive you. You've given so much right from the very beginning, and of course, most of all, we're so grateful that you've given your very self in Jesus Christ. Lord God, we lift to you those who struggle in this season, those who are finding gratitude difficult. We ask that something of your presence will enter into their lives and, and give them a sense of your presence that they might begin to reflect upon all that they owe you just as we owe you. And that you'll give them a calming presence, a sense that all will be well. And gracious God, help us in this time to be such a presence to one another and to others that others will be grateful for us. And when they are grateful, may they not thank us, but thank you. Because as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, to we are to live our lives in such a way that others will see what we do and give thanks to our Father in heaven. Help us to point to you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Reconciled, Lord, let us meet you. 